Hello and welcome to Jason's Macintosh Museum. I'm Jason, your host, and today we're looking at a Macintosh LC from 1990. In one sense, all you need to know about the Macintosh LC is contained in the name, LC, which stands for Low Cost Colour. The LC was Apple's first attempt at making a genuinely low cost colour Macintosh. And this came about mainly because by the late 1980s, Apple's systems were rising in price dramatically. They were becoming more and more sophisticated, but there was no low-end machines to, to fill out their range of products. At the time, you could still buy the old uh, Macintosh Plus, for example, but that was a black and white only machine. It didn't have much expandability, didn't accept an internal hard disk, and it only had an 8 megahertz Motorola 68000 CPU, which was starting to become obsolete um, by the late 1980s. So what Apple had to do was they had to develop a up-to-date color system, but at a competitive price, mainly for the educational market. And that's exactly what the LC was aimed at. But in order to get the price of the machine down to an acceptable level, in fact, I think the base model LC cost, um, I think it was less than $1,000, in fact, um, without a monitor. So it was very cheap, but in order to get the price down to that level, quite a few sacrifices had to be made in the areas of expandability and performance, in fact. Some of which you may, you, in retrospect, you have to ask yourself, why did they bother in terms of crippling the machine the way they did? But we'll come to that in a moment. So first of all, what you lose with the LC is expandability. As you can see, it has a very, very compact um, called a, a pizza box style case, which means that it's very compact, very easy to set up and very easy to work with. Again, ideal for an educational environment. However, because of that, you only have one expansion slot and it was actually known as a LC uh, processor direct slot. So it in fact was not new bus compatible. So the only cards you could put into the LC were cards that were specifically designed for use with the LC. Having said that, though, it did have built-in video, so you didn't have to put a video card into the system, which was a, which was a plus. But the other, the other uh, cost-cutting measures that Apple took with this machine were, due to, were, were really the machine's architecture. If you look at the specifications of the LC, they match very closely the old Macintosh 2 that came out about three years earlier, in 1987 in that both machines used a 16 megahertz Motorola 68020 CPU. So you would think that they would be roughly about the same performance, but unfortunately, that's not the case. The first thing Apple did to save money with the LC was they put the CPU, the 68020, which is a 32-bit CPU, they put it on a 16-bit data bus. Now, that impacted on performance quite significantly. And in addition to that, the system, the memory controller in the system was designed to only accept up to 10 megabytes of built-in memory. You, it would not address any more than that. And that was a little unusual because the way that the LC was designed was that you had two 30-pin SIM slots. So, Yes, you could put in two four megabyte modules and with the two megabytes of built-in memory that would take you up to 10 megabytes. But if you tried to put in any larger 30 pin SIMs, they simply wouldn't work. And that problem became even more apparent with the LC's successor, the LC2, which had four megabytes of memory built in. If you added two four megabyte SIMs, you'd get 12 megabytes. But as before, the memory control could only access 10 megabytes of that. So you ended up losing two megabytes of the system memory, which was, uh, which was a bit of a shame. What Apple also did with the LC was to remove the option for a paged memory management unit, a PMMU chip. Because if you're familiar with the Macintosh 2, the 68020 CPU doesn't have a built-in PMMU. So you need to add one externally. Now in the Macintosh 2, you're able to do that through a, a socket, but that was not provided on the LC. And the consequence of that 
was that the LC could not use virtual memory, which was introduced with System 7 uh, just after the release of the LC. And combining that with a 10 megabyte memory limit, that was a bit of a problem. And in addition to that, there was no numeric coprocessor fitted as standard either, although you could add one through the expansion slot. Now, because the LC was primarily designed for the educational market, there was one useful option that was available with the LC, and that was called the Apple IIe card. Now, I've mentioned this in my video on the Macintosh Color Classic, um, but I'll go over it again now quickly. The Apple IIe card was a LC PDS card that you could fit into an LC, um, LC2, LC3, um, or Color Classic. And it, in conjunction with a special external five and a quarter inch floppy drive, let you run Apple II software on the Macintosh LC natively. There was no emulation involved. It was basically a 2E, an entire 2E system on a card. So that schools that were using the Apple IIs and 2 Pluses and 2Es and 2C machines, they could purchase an LC and still be able to use all of their old um, Apple II software. So that was quite, uh, quite, uh, quite a good um, idea. Now, Apple didn't just cut costs on the LC from the system itself. They also cut costs in terms of the monitors that were available for use with them. Because with the LC, Apple introduced a special 12-inch uh, um, color monitor, which was known as, the I think it was the Apple 12-inch uh, Apple display. I think that was the name of it. And it was designed to work with the LC. In fact, the, the monitor fits perfectly on top of the LC, it's the same width, and it, was, it, it makes the LC look like a very integrated uh, package. But there was a drawback, in that that monitor only supported a resolution of 512 by 384 pixels, rather than the standard 640 by 480 that Color Macintosh machines had used up until that point. And as a result of that, if you bought an LC and specified that special monitor, you may find that some color graphics software simply wouldn't run at all because it was expecting the standard 640 by 480 resolution. Uh, you may find that it may run, but the screen may be distorted or you may not see the entire image on the screen because of the lower resolution. Having said that though, you could connect a standard Macintosh monitor to the LC and run it at a higher resolution. Um, but I believe you had to upgrade the video memory inside the LC before you could do that because the built-in memory in the LC only supported 8-bit um, color at the lower 512 by 384 resolution. If you needed that color depth at 640 by 480, you had to put extra VRAM into it. So, some more details on the LC. It was launched in October of 1990 along with the Macintosh 2 assigned Macintosh Classic as part of Apple's range of new models. And it was discontinued in March of 1992 when the LC2 replaced it. Now with the LC, you could have either a 40 or 80 megabyte hard disk, and you had one 1.4 megabyte Apple SuperDrive. You had two megabytes of memory on board as standard expandable up to 10 megabytes. Although for the educational market, there was a special version of the LC that actually included twin floppy drives, no hard disk and the Apple IIe card. So that was a, um, that was a model obviously intended for people who were, who were going to use their LC more as, a two, as an Apple II than they were as a Macintosh. Um, the CPU, a 16 megahertz Motorola 68020 CPU, no numeric coprocessor, no memory management unit, which meant you couldn't use virtual memory, and the built-in video, you got 8-bit color, but only at the lower 512 by 384 resolution that was supported by the LC's dedicated uh, monitor. But despite all the limitations, though, the LC was apparently a very popular machine. And certainly subsequent models, such as the LC2, LC3, and LC475, um, also sold very well. Although it really wasn't until the LC3 came out in 1993 that Apple really fixed all the shortcomings with the original LC. To give you an example, when the LC2 came out in 1992, I believe it was, 
The CPU had been upgraded to a Motorola 68030 at 16 megahertz. However, it was still on a 16-bit data bus and you could still only address 10 megabytes of memory uh, in total. So there wasn't really much of an improvement there. But with LC3, they went to a 25 megahertz 030, but on a full 32-bit data bus, which improved the performance dramatically. And in addition, there was no hard limit on the amount of memory that you could put into the system. So that's the details on the Macintosh LC. So what we'll do now is we'll have a closer look at it. Here's the front view of the Macintosh LC. And you can see that it is a very, very slimline casing. In fact, a lot of people call it a pizza box style case because it's roughly the same, has the same footprint as a pizza box and it's about the same height. So very, very clean styling from the front. We've got the Macintosh LC nameplate and Apple logo here. Over here we have the blanking plate for the optional second 1.4 megabyte Apple SuperDrive. But in this system, as with most LCs, the hard disk would sit just behind here. Over here we have the built-in 1.4 megabyte SuperDrive that came as standard. And, well, that's, that's about it. Not much on the front, as you can see. No uh, indicator lights, um, no reset or interrupt, interrupt uh, switches, nothing. Again, all part of Apple's attempt to keep the cost of the LC down. So that's the front view. So we'll switch over and we'll have a look at the back. Here is the rear view of the Macintosh LC. And starting from the top, we have the two latches that you need to release in order to take the top cover off. One there and one over there. Then moving over back to the left, we have the power inlet and power switch. And the LC does not support soft power. Uh, so you have to turn the system on with this physical power switch. We've got the monitor port for the built-in video here. We have the printer and modem ports here. External SCSI, ADB, and audio input and output. Because the LC, along with the Macintosh 2SI, were in fact the first models of Mac to support sound recording. And then over from there, we have the blanking plate for the LC processor direct slot. So that's the rear view of the Macintosh LC. So now we'll take it apart. Just before we take the LC apart, I just realized we have to look at the bottom of the case because this is where Apple places their serial number label as well as the machine's information label. So this is the bottom of the, the case. So over here we have the, the details of the machine. So you can see Macintosh LC assembled in Singapore. The various uh, certifications there, copyright 1991 Apple Computer Incorporated. And down the bottom left is the serial number, focus, the, the serial number and production information tags. So you can see that this, uh, by the looks of this, this would have been produced in the, looks like the 50th week of 1991 at Apple's Singapore facility. Because I think it was, it was probably sometime around the late 80s when Apple started making some of their machines in factories in, in countries other than the United States. So this is one of them. Taking a Macintosh LC apart is uh, really quite simple, mainly because there isn't much in the case to begin with. But I believe that this can be disassembled uh, without any tools, just like the uh, 2CX, 2CI and 2SI. So the first step is taking off the top cover. So we have to release these two plastic clips here. But I should warn you, on the LC machines, especially when they get to be as old as these machines are, you have to be very careful not to apply too much force on these clips as you bend them up because they do, they can and do break off or snap off just here. So you have to be very, very careful as you release the, the clips. Don't, don't put too much pressure on them. There we are. And then when you've uh, released the clips, you can tip the cover and remove it. 
So here we have the internals of the LC and just rotate it around so it's facing to the front. So what we have is the hard disk here. We have the, <coughs> excuse me, the floppy drive here, power supply here, and the logic board here, and the cooling fan and speaker assembly in the middle. So it's actually a very compact and well-integrated system. So the first thing we'll do is uh, we might take the power supply out. So to do that, just unhook the power connector here. And then we have a plastic clip over here and one on the other side you have to bend out in order to release the power supply. So actually I'm going to cheat, I'm going to use a uh, small flathead screwdriver to do this. We'll just bend that clip out, bend that clip out, and then the power supply should pop up like that and you can pull it straight out of the system. Notice that it's not a very um, high powered power supply, well it doesn't need to be. In fact I think it's only about, um, uh, by the looks of it, it's probably no more than about um, 50 watts I would say by the, uh, by the looks of it. But uh, anyhow it uh, does the job just fine. And uh, notice there's no fan inside the power supply, in fact the, uh, the, the central cooling fan here is the only fan in the system. What we'll do now is take out the floppy drive and to do that we'll just unplug the connector from the logic board over here. Yeah. There are two plastic clips on this side, and two on the other side. So just lift up on the drive carefully as you bend those clips out. And then the entire drive will lift straight out of the system. Next is the hard drive. So we'll just unhook the, the data and power connectors from the logic board. And as with the floppy drive, bend out the two plastic clips on either side and the drive will release, hopefully. This one's a bit sticky. I'm gonna just unplug the uh, cables from the back as well so I don't don't damage them. There we go. So let's try on this side. Let's lift up on the... Uh, this has obviously been uh, in here a while. It's, uh, it's a little bit stuck. Oh, there we go. That's it. So now the drive comes straight out. Next up is the speaker and fan assembly. And this actually uses spring contacts down here to connect to the logic board. All you have to do is release one plastic clip here and one here to I think release it from here, then release it from here, and then you pivot this end up. And then you can carefully lift whole assembly out. So you can see that the fan and the speaker both sit in this casing and we have the spring connectors here that mate with these pads on the logic board. Next up, well the last thing really in fact to remove is the logic board itself. To do that we have to slide it forwards but we have to release a little plastic clip over here and one over here. So if we bend them out while pushing forwards on the board carefully, you can see that it does slowly start to move. You know, a little trick would be to, to push back on the ports from through the, through the back cover while the clips are disengaged to give the board a bit of a push. So then when it's rotated, when it's slid forward, you can pull the board straight out and there's the, there's the logic board. And that's basically it. There's uh, nothing more in the case. So now we have the LC disassembled, we'll have a look at some of the components. Here is the logic board from the Macintosh LC. So starting from the top, we have the uh, identification there, Apple Computer Incorporated, copyright 1990. We have all the different ports along the top here.
then I think from here we have, I, it's probably the audio chip, I'm not actually quite sure. Um, and uh, I noticed that the capacitors on this board are actually original, so I will have to uh, replace those uh, very soon. Uh, we've got the SCSI controller over here. I think they're the serial port transceivers there. Uh, here we have the, oh, that's the digital to analog converter for the onboard video. Then here we have the SIM slot for the video memory, just there. So that's used to expand, well, actually not to expand, I should say that the LC does not have any onboard video memory, so you actually have to have a video RAM SIM in that slot for the machine to function. And then to the right of that we have the two 30-pin SIM slots for expansion of the system memory. And you can see over here we have two megabytes worth of DRAM chips over here. So that's the built-in system memory. Power connector over here. Uh, what else do we have? That's probably the main glue logic chip there. Got the two clock crystals there. Four ROM chips over here. Here's the main CPU, the Motorola 68020 at 16 megahertz. Focus. There we go. <laughs> and so this makes um, the LC one of only two models of Macintosh to ever use the 020 CPU. The other one being, of course, the original Macintosh 2. Uh, I think that's the uh, CUDA chip there that controls the uh, real-time clock and uh, possibly the keyboard as well. Um, what else? Uh, down here we've got these, the socket for the PRAM battery. There are the contacts for the fan and speaker assembly. There's the SCSI connector for the hard disk and the power connector. And above it is the connector for the optional second floppy drive because the LC, I think, was one of only a handful of Macs that lets you have twin internal floppy drives. Uh, I think the other ones were the, the 2X, 2, 2, 2X and 2FX could all have that, as could the SE. Um, and also the LC, and I think every, all the other Macs could only have one internal floppy. And over here we have the LC PDS, the processor direct slot, for your expansion card, if you have one. So it's actually a very well integrated board. Um, so that's, that's it. That's the logic board from the Macintosh LC. So we'll have a quick look at the hard disk now. Here is the hard disk from the Macintosh LC. And this was the original drive that would have shipped with the machine when it was new. So it's a Quantum Pro Drive LPS. It's a 40 megabyte unit. Apple branded, copyright 1990. But just like other models of Macintosh, any 50 pin SCSI drive will function. So as you can see, we have the we have the data and power connectors there and uh, the controller underneath there. But just a standard 50 pin SCSI drive, nothing, uh, nothing fancy about that at all. So that concludes part one of the video series on the Macintosh LC. So in the next video, I'll reassemble the LC, we'll start it up, and try some old Macintosh applications and games. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and thank you for watching.